Time goes on. It gets more complicated. We construct a more elaborate eye. And somehow, amazingly, we believe we have to make all of these tapes come into one place, one coalescence. It's just somehow how I was in math at age seven has anything to do with how I am today as an adult functioning in a situation like this. Completely unrelated, we somehow believe we have to reconcile those into one single construct to all make sense and is all happy every day. It's insane. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you have to do that? Recognize that if you play soccer, you will have one kind of eye function, not memory base. If you go out and get dressed, a whole different person manifests. Those are not the same person. They don't have to be the same person. Why do you believe they have to be? One of the big questions we get if we take apart the eye is who then decides to take an action? Uh, Benjamin Lippett did one of the great experiments at UCSF in 1983. Folks looked at a clock, flexed their wrist, and they were supposed to say, okay, uh, I'm not aware of the decision to flex my wrist. I'm flexing my wrist. My wrist is flexed. We also put, he also put uh, electrodes on the motor cortex to see what the brain was up to, and also looked at the muscles themselves so they went to the movement actually take place. Big surprise, big surprise. Uh, this is like the experiment in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, the brain activity actually started before you were aware it was going to take place. Schematically, it looks like this. The brain initiates the movement. We're not aware of it. A third of a second later, we're informed it's going to take place. A quarter of a second later, lo and behold, the action takes place. This has been done, replicated so many ways, so many times you can imagine. Uh, people didn't like this answer, nobody felt comfortable with it, but in fact, this has been worked and overworked. Uh, new technology is a fantastic BBC video uh, you can get access to, it was done with German Research Institute that does this with the very best technology now, FMRI, special equipment, the same thing happens. Brain, the cortex initiates the movement, you're told sometime later, much as six seconds later, you're aware of it, and the action takes place. We also think, well, this eye, this is the thing that really solves all the problems. What would we do if we didn't have an eye? Who would solve the problems? Well, the, one of the leading papers in this area, some great stuff in 2009, looked at this, with complex thought problems. Not simple A, B, C, D problems, but A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, J problems. Found out that, in fact, they could predict 100% EEG, fMRI, brain scanning, when the problem had been solved. So it was 15 seconds later, a minute and a half later, 10 minutes later, they could tell, okay, the problem has been solved. They're going to send a message up to the message center and say, look, we solved this problem. 100%. The conscious eye did not solve the problem. The problem was solved offline. So we've been alluded to several times in this conference before, the unconscious processor offline is what actually solves the problems. Schematically, what this looks like, we have a very, very small RAM, little tiny DRAM. It can process seven plus or minus two things, whether they're symbols, graphics, numbers, colors, uh, seven dissociated things we can hold in consciousness, short-term working memory, jabber jabber mind, seven things. We have this little tiny round piece of it. Thankfully, underneath we have this massive 100 billion neurons with trillions of connections. Massive hard drive, many high-speed parallel processors, primary consciousness, this is the real workhorse. This little tiny mind sitting on top of this thing has no ability to solve the kind of problems we're talking about. It's all done offline. Questions that come up, if you lose your eye, or if you lose spots, how will you function? How am I going to get through the day? Will I end up sitting in a corner someplace, mumbling to myself, uh, unable to feed myself? Well, in fact, this is what happens. Uh, you are present moment by moment by moment. Your mind is in some place else and you're doing something here. You're right here 100% of the time. 
Stuff, opportunities of all kinds arise, as they always have. You don't create them, you never did create them. They come up unexpectedly and on time and perfect. The thing I have found is that when you go into meetings, whether it's a boardroom, negotiation, uh, meeting your friends, you're the only person that's there 100%. If you look at yourself as somebody else, you're there 20% of the time, you're thinking about the next conversation you're going to have. Think about what you're going to do tomorrow. I can't be this person so boring or whatever. Seeing him, um, he'll be there all the time. You'll often appear surprisingly the smartest person in the room because you're the only one that's there a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> and how will you know what to say if you don't have any thoughts? Well, if you notice, the right thing will come up out of the stillness, out of this huge primary consciousness. Just, it just pops up. What you're speaking doesn't arise from any kind of a, you know, I pre thought all of these thoughts. You watch yourself, not just that I don't have any thoughts and I keep talking. You keep talking. You don't think about what you're going to say. If you did, you'd never get out of your mind. You would never be able to hold a conversation. You don't pre think your thoughts as you speak. How will you decide what plan anything? No, I. No thoughts. Uh, you have to be delusional to bring you the plan. The great news is that these are unaffected. They're not self-referential. If you take apart the eye, what falls away are the self-referential thoughts, desires, and fears. This stuff, planning, which is the only thing that DRAM is really good for, is planning, is untouched. It will not have a confusion of endless debate about options that really have no end to it. It's endless circular loops we get into that never seem to close. Last observation that the concern is, won't people see how strange I am? If I don't have thoughts and I'm walking around town, won't people look at me really funny? Well, to my surprise, there's no way to tell whether people are externally, externally awake or not awake. In directions, a publisher used to have a conference in La Jolla, California every year where all the big, big uh, non-dualistic uh, awakened people came and talked. The great observation was that you couldn't tell them apart. And Eckhart Tolle didn't walk above the ground, Tony Parsons didn't have a glow around him, there was no special charisma they had. They were just people hanging out there, just like everybody else, they were just real people going through a real day and behaving like everybody else. You cannot tell if someone's awake or not. Yeah, when that happened to me, I thought, well, I'll go to the office that day, and people will say, oh, he's really changed. Good news, bad news, couldn't tell. Nobody cared. How I was functioning in that day. Your patterns of behavior are so well established, so well set by the time we're in this room, that you are not going to suddenly diverge from them dramatically. You're not going to suddenly decide to be a professional basketball player or a soccer player or whatever. You just can't do it. You've got certain conditions, certain constraints upon you that you've been bred into, genetically engineered into, and in fact you are not going to diverge from those long-established patterns. Good news, bad news. That's my talk. The, uh, I do have a book, but I donate any profits from any of my teaching to handicapped working kids in South India. So, don't worry about making me rich off of this. Um, let's look at that. Any questions?